Today we're going to talk about our paper for the uh, ITherm 2012 ITherm conference about variable fidelity methodology for thermal battery modeling. First off, uh, what do we mean by variable fidelity? Well, variable fidelity is bringing together both 3D modeling capabilities uh, such as CFD modeling uh, with a full radiation network and uh, any kind of Julian heating and coupling that in with network modeling where you can model uh, 1D flow bars um, looking at, uh, at minor and major l pressure losses uh, through those systems and uh, also extended thermal network models uh, using a resistance capacitance network approach as well as different thermodynamic systems so that you can look at any two-phase refrigeration cycles um, or any other kind of thermodynamic component. The way that we bring this together is by directly coupling the 3D CFD model um, and creating components of those models that will be found within the actual 1D system. So you can have an uh, embedded flow bar within a 3D model, or you could have a 3D CFD model that's embedded into the 1D system. And those will be solved simultaneously within the same solver, so you're not having to go between different uh, softwares. <coughs> you can also have resistive links, um, which are just uh, sort of thermal links going between nodes found in both the 3D side and the, the 1D side, and, and those are in essence, zero node models. So you could have a link taking it directly from your um, a thermodynamic component that represents your engine and directing that into a 3D model of something that's sitting uh, near to the engine or, or on the engine. <coughs> so why is this necessary? Well, today with the uh, electrification of, of many systems uh, throughout, um, throughout industry, uh, especially in, in automotive today, it's creating a lot of opportunities for thermal optimization, but it's, it's also creating a lot of new challenges. Um, so there's a lot of new advanced technologies out there, um, such as nanotechnology, the new chips, um, liquid metal cooling, stuff like that. But before you really put in the effort to, to incorporating this into your overall system, it's best to make sure that you've optimized the system as much as you can. Uh, and the only way really you can do this is by creating a full system model that's looking detailedly into the components themselves. So uh, now we're going to talk, talk a little, a little more depth about the actual embedding of um, 1D flow bars into the 3D. So what we have is that, uh, as you can see in this image down here, we have represented flow bars that are going in through a cold plate in a full 3D model. The flow is com handled completely on the 1D side, but it's picking up temperature um, through the 3D model, and that's specified through either some kind of correlation, through a nuzzle number, uh, an H value from previous uh, CFD analysis, or however however you feel like getting, getting that information through. Uh, and then as the fluid comes in, it's, it is picking up the temperature, as you can see, and then that's adjusting how much heat it's pulling out of the 3D model. This is ideal for modeling uh, any kind of liquid cooling channels or cold plates or even putting complex heat exchangers into a, a, into a 3D system. Next type of modeling is actually having the CFD in the loop. So what this means is that you have a, a 1D system going through and then at one point in that system you want to have a complex 3D simulation so something that you can't really model um, in 1D but you don't know your inlet and your outlet boundary conditions so what this allows you to do is instead of having the having to go and run an analysis and say okay well I have about this much pressure drop across it it's going to be automatically updating the pressure at the inlet and the outlet uh, for this, and then incrementally it'll be switching back and back and forth between the 1D and the 3D. So, if we see here, we have a, a system where we have a pump and a, a battery cell and a heat exchanger. So this would be modeled in 1D here, where we just have some kind of 1D system for the for the battery cell. But sometimes we actually have something that you can't really model in 1D. So if we have a more of a complex flow here, 
then this is going to be this is going to be run all simultaneously with the 1D system. So we still have our heat exchanger in 1D using correlations that have been tested. Um, we have our pump, which is which is going to be very simple to set up. But we are still seeing the effect that this spot here is going to get hot because there's no flow going through it. So that we can come in here and see, well, what happens if I put a, a fin in there? How's that going to affect both the flow internal to this and then the pressure drop across that? How is that going to affect the rest of my system? Now we also have a full thermodynamic analysis uh, capabilities for it um, that allows you to to go through and and look at uh, <coughs> look at the efficiency of your system, to look at different refrigeration cycles, heat pump cycles, uh, pressure loss from friction and and minor losses, and um, all of the fluid properties are taken directly from the National Institutes of Standard and Technology's material library so that you're not having to go through and enter in properties for quality um, or any of the other material properties. So there's, it takes out the, the lookup table uh, and those are all built into the, to the code itself. Okay, now we're just going to look at a, a quick video here. Uh, for our paper, we've modeled a, a volt system and the Volt system is a, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and we can see our, our battery model here with the, um, the power inverter and, uh, and various other electronics components and we've modeled the battery in, in some detail because that's a, a very interesting thermal issue where you're not only trying to keep it cool but you're also trying to keep it warm so it's done by, by LG what a modular approach, so it's made up of nine different modules. Each of those modules will make up many of these little fins here. And we can see the two battery cells that are each giving off a couple of watts, and then the cooling channel um, within those cells. So you want this cell to stay uh, between um, about three degrees within the cell, um, from the ma minimum to the maximum temperature, and in the range of about 30 degrees. And then, as we so we have flow going in between those cells, and then these are all run in parallel. Uh, so this has all been done um, with these cooling cells all with the 1D approach, then coupled into a 3D approach with the cells in between them in a 3D model, um, so that you have a, a full uh, a full 3D model, and you can quickly see the effects of changing the size of the the cooling uh, fin channels or seeing the effects of, of modifying your pump or anything downstream and the, the temperature that's been picked up. <coughs> and then at the same time we're also incorporating that into the rest of the, the cooling system loop. So we're looking at uh, the engines, um, the, the IC engine, we're looking at the um, transmission cooler, the, the refrigeration system within the model. So this here is uh, represented by this and we still have our, our inlet and then the outlet and uh, plug-in charger and then this power inverter is another 3D model so you have a full electronics model and we can see as any changes are occurring what's what's the temperature of my IGBT within the power inverter um, I'm not just having to say well the the temperature of the inlet flow rate is is at a point where I think that my power inverter might be in trouble I can actually look at the power inverter while the whole system is running and say uh, even though this is at a higher point, it hasn't yet um, got to uh, the, the components itself haven't actually got to a temperature where they are at or their critical point. So that maybe in a transient simulation, you can get away with more than you thought you could, and you can actually increase um, some of the set points that you have. <coughs> the heat exchanger is modeled using um, using a Case in London approach. Uh, so we do actually have different quadrants that are run, and um, and then we're using a, a JF model, and the properties are taken from a, a paper on uh, on louvered fin heat exchangers. And so this is all built into the component model itself. And if you have uh, any kind of different correlations, those can be entered in as well. Here we have our battery model, both the the one D and the three D. So we have a three D battery model. And then here's the the different modules, each made up of of this. So you have subcomponent within subcomponent within subcomponent, and then these cooling fins are actually made up of of multiple um, flow bars, uh, which are going through the cooling fins in the 3D model.
Okay, here we, we see some results, and, and basically we've used this uh, just as a way of showing its capabilities to optimize for, um, for trying to maintain an even temperature distribution across both individual cell and from the first cell all the way to the last cell. Um, and since it is in a parallel flow, the more flow that goes through the first cell, the less that goes through the last cell. So as we increase more and more um, flow going through that first one, we're going to be decreasing from the end, and therefore the, the first one will cool down, the last one's going to heat up. Um, so the, there is a balance to, to keeping everything at, at the right point. And for this, it, it found that 1.25 was the um, smallest, or it was the largest that we could go to, to get our temperature. Um, and we wanted to keep that as big as possible so that we had less pressure drop uh, so that we didn't have to overwork our pump. And here we just see some, some temperature plots. You can see the, the 1D plot of the uh, temperature picking up the heat here and then how that relates to the, the 3D model uh, looking at a cup plane through, through one of the cells and then the overall temperature. You can see it's a little cooler here than it is over here, but uh, basically it's all, um, if you look at this, all, all within a, a few degrees of each other. So as, as we've touched on, um, really having an overall system model does give you an ability to look at uh, all of the changes, um, all of the changes that, all of the effects, sorry, that, that you will have from making a change to a minor part in your model. So if I change something in the heat exchanger, I can see how that's affecting my overall system. Or if I increase power to one of the, um, to the power inverters, how is that going to affect some electronics downstream of that? I can also use it to determine required flow rates, um, the refrigeration, the amount of, of power that I'm going to need for for my um, refrigeration system. And uh, also, you can link this in then to MATLAB and use it to, test, to test your embedded software uh, so that you can actually put together your thermal management algorithms based on a, a full system model of, of a greater complexity than you would normally be able. Okay, so thank you for, for your time. If you have any questions, uh, please do um, contact us. The um, modeling and simulation uh, techniques are, are very valuable tools for design and evaluation of, of any thermal management systems. And uh, we really see a, a great need for, for this uh, sort of thing across all um, OEM and, and Tier 1 uh, system suppliers um, so that we can stop modeling for the worst case for all the different components and start modeling more of the real case um, and looking at, at different missions and, and transients to, to really be able to get as much out of our system as we can.